Um, I, I was just telling our listeners that um, I never spoke to you until yesterday, and you reached, we, we talked last night for a couple of hours, and it, it's like we've known each other all our lives. Um, I have nothing to say over me other than Hashem should comfort you, and um, I have nothing smarter to say than that, and, and I hope nothing nicer to say that Hashem should comfort you. Well, thank you. I mean, that, that is the smartest thing to say because that's just, that's what we talk, we say to our very many ways. So that's the smartest thing we say. Chachamim, the great wisdom, told us to to um, not use our words sometimes when 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 words don't uh, when words don't come. Um, so, just throw some thoughts on your chavetz uh, first first yard site. Um, I must tell you, if if any of you out there did not go to your chavetz page. Um, the, the second and third posts, the first one was unfortunately about, about um, herself, and then she posted a, two pictures of her singing with her father. And the videos, yeah. The two videos of, uh, of, of Remy. I didn't know you play. I, I didn't, we didn't even talk uh, personal stuff last night. That, that yeah. play, look, you're playing the piano, looked a little more than just a, a weekend uh, music player. I'm, I, I do music for a living. Oh, okay. There you yeah. go. There you go. It looks more than that. If you just look at those videos, you'll find out about Avrami Afel. I just um, was incredibly impressed, and, and it was just a beautiful thing to see as someone who works with parents, and, and uh, it was really a beautiful thing to see. So just please share some thoughts what, and what the public, you know, what, what your message would be to to parents and to community members overall. Um, go, please. Message? Well, I mean, in order to um, talk about a message, uh, why don't I briefly just give you a little bit of background into who Yechevet was and what our struggles please. were. Please. And then I guess from that we can derive some kind of message. Right? Absolutely. So, Yecheva passed away last year on Zion Tavis, December 22nd. She took her life. Um, in her words, she completed suicide. Um, she had uh, suffered for, for the better part of 10 years with mental illness, uh, manifested mostly by um, eating disorder, anorexia, and severe depression, anxiety, and, and so on. Um, a lot of self-harm, which we only discovered, we did not know at first that she was self-harming. And uh, when we did discover that she was self-harming, we didn't, we didn't understand what self-harm was at the time. And we didn't understand, uh, a therapist that I spoke to, you know, when, when this happened and I, you know, I was, I was like feeling guilty for all the things that I did and could have done and didn't do and so on, he told me, listen, you know, you know, why don't you, why can't you build a rocket ship? And, and the reason is because you can't, you know, you don't have the instruction manual and kids don't come with instruction manuals and we all learn on the job kind of thing. We should get parenting tips. There's no question about it. Uh, we should get tips on how to be a husband or a wife and we should get tips and so on. So there's a lot of, we didn't, I didn't, didn't understand. And uh, over the years, we understood that self harm is a way of coping, uh, expressing pain, even, even an eating disorder in her case. I'm not a therapist, so this is just my own experience. So maybe for everybody else, it's a little different. But in her case, uh, it might have been some kind of, of, of uh, coping mechanism for something. <clears throat> and um, so this is going on for many, many years. At the same time, even though that in this part of, the life, of her life, she was unsuccessful in finding happiness and finding nefesh and so on. She was super successful academically and super successful um, as a human being, meaning as a nice person. She was just a beautiful person inside and out. There was not a rebellious bone in her body. There was not an angry bone in her body. Um, even though she, um, she, we come from a Chabad family. She went to Mon North Rocks High School and to college after that. It wasn't done out of rebellion. It was done out of 
what her needs were. And uh, we tried our best to cater to those needs. We didn't try to keep her in the Dawid school system. She didn't leave the Chabad school system for reasons of, re of rebellion. She left because, um, you know, the school that she went to, Shalhevet, Rudresha Shalhevet in the five towns, was the correct school for her. She continued to suffer on and off. She was hospitalized. Um, her successful attempt was the last of three. So it was the final attempt after three attempts. Um, what lessons can be learned? I mean, this is such a, you know, massive topic. Um, let's talk about, I guess most of your audience is from audience. Am I right about that? I would imagine so. You imagine no, so. Okay. You know, if I, if I can just, uh, I'm guilty of giving you too broad a question. I just want to, I just want to, um, I just want to share with you, uh, Avrami, that your being on here is the message, is part of the message. You know, having dealt with, with teens at risk and kids who were, um, unfortunately, you know, I've gone to many shiva homes of, uh, it never gets easier, of course, and, and, and gone to shiva homes of children never hooked up their lives. And up until five, ten years ago, um, most of them were presented as aneurysms. You know, it wasn't something that people talked about. It was, it was, I mean, you know, I'm not even talking over the breadth of history, you know, over the last 200 years. I'm talking about the 25 years that I've been involved in this space. Um, it was almost, almost unheard of to a parent to do what you're doing. So, um, Call a vote to you. I, I think you're doing, I do believe that you're doing a tremendous public service um, because people don't, by and large, don't understand a lot of, a lot of depression and anxiety and, and you know, self-harm and, and giving it a name and talking about it in a way that people can relate to when they see things to, number one, be start at least knowing that they don't know and, and reaching out for help. Oh, I, fully, I fully admit, I still, I still don't fully understand. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yes, I, I'm saying, but to the extent that, to the extent that you're graciously sharing, you know, giving us a window into, into, your, into your pain and your life, in your daughter's life is, is extraordinarily helpful. I, I cannot tell you what it means for, and for people who are suffering in silence and, you know, people come over and pat them on the back and say, why don't you just get over it? You know, my, my, my father died when I was three and my mother always said that until she had, until she had the tragedy of my father's death, she was just a housewife, you know, minding her own business. And then everybody had an opinion. She was, she had too much makeup on until your husband just died. Why are you putting on makeup? Put on makeup, you got to, you know, she was too strict with the kids or too gentle with the kids. And, and then her father told her, Bela, just ignore everybody and do what you think is right and just turn off the noise. So, you know, the people who are suffering from the depression and anxiety, you know, depression in the first place, and then people come over and, and foolishly, and well-intentioned, but foolishly say things to them. Um, hearing you talk about it and, and seeing that video with the incredible love for your daughter, mutual love for the two of you, I think it's such a very powerful statement. Well, thank, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. I'm not sure that I'm deserving of all those kind of words because there were times that I was frustrated when I didn't understand. And uh, there were times, excuse me, I'm sorry. There were times that uh, I got, you know, angry out of frustration. But I did try, and I think I got better over the years, and she knew that. And we were incredibly close. And we shared a lot of the same kind of personality traits. Um, in terms of, you mentioned uh, teens at risk. Um, Yechevet was not traditionally Chabad. And I'm going to explain to you what that means in a second. But uh, in my mind, I, I, when you say the word teens at risk, are, are teens that go off the derech and get involved in all kinds of behaviors that are, that are harmful and so on. I never looked at Yechevet as a teen at risk, um, who's, even though she did lead a more of a modern lifestyle than a Chabad young lady would. Um, I'm looking at a letter she wrote us, and she talked about, and this is the lesson I learned, you know, she taught us many, many lessons, and I'll just tell you a couple of them. 
uh, and I speak about it in other interviews, that she never liked to go to show. All right, so you think of, you talk about teens at risk. No, I'm not going to show. And the first thing that comes to your mind is that those that don't go to show are do so out of rebellion. It's not for me, you know. What's what's daft with us, you know? Let me stay home. Let me have fun. God's not for me. I don't believe in God. So she wrote to us, and um, I'm thinking perhaps I should just quote her words directly. Um, um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna read to her. her I'm gonna read to her exact words because I think they're amazing. Um, my connection with God is fleeting. When I can connect, I'm so overwhelmed with love and gratitude that they spill over into tears until I can no longer feel at all. I don't like going to show or similar environments because I have to hold back my true feelings. I have to hold back my raw emotion from turning into heart-wrenching cries. I can't make a scene in public. And so for many years, I was seen as a rebel, someone who hated religion and God, someone who hated my com community and wished I had no part in it. But really, I simply didn't understand. And what I did understand was too much to share with the world that it was easier to turn my back. I think about God every day, at least every hour, sometimes every minute, every second. I think about my purpose, God's purpose, and so on. So the lesson to be learned is that the reason she didn't want to go to shul is because of her very, very strong connection to God, not right. because of a weak connection to God. And I think this should be a lesson to every one of us that when we see those uh, people among us, even our age or young people, doesn't matter what the really age is, and they are seemingly disinterested in religion, you know, don't write them off. Don't, you know, make a, a psychological profile and say, uh, you know, I'm the good one. You know, you've kind of, you know, lost, lost the way. So I think it's a very important lesson. Incredibly important lesson. The other, um, the other, you can stop me whenever you want, by the way. No, I'll please, just, please. Stop. Um, the I'm other learning, the other lesson is about religion and mental health. And that is, by the way, I don't think that, you know, oftentimes you'll get a comment that mental health has, is more prevalent in the, in the firm community or the firm community deals with it in a worse way than secular community. I don't think that's true. We have our own, we have our own challenges, which are unique, unique to the firm community. And there are challenges, by the way, that the secular community have, which are different to ours. Okay. Uh, but, I, I agree with you. I don't, right. you know, I don't think, uh, I don't think the incidence is higher. I just, it's just that we're not exempt from the world problems. Exactly. So, but, but the message is that when you're dealing with mental health, just as you're dealing with physical health, you know, God forbid someone has a heart attack on a Friday night, you call that solid. You know, someone needs to take a medication that's not kosher, you take it. Same thing goes with mental health. Don't for one minute, uh, try to put your religion ahead of, uh, of your mental health uh, um, uh, regimen. So, for example, um, in December of 2019, about two years ago, Yechever and I attended the, uh, the, uh, the Halloween parade in, in East Village. Oh, boy. <laughs> not, yeah. necessarily a, not necessarily a place for a good Jewish boy or girl, but I love music. She loved music. We love the drama. We love the you know the glitz and everything. And, and you love and you loved each other. And we loved each other exactly. So we went. And as we're standing, we went very early because we wanted to get get, get a good spot. And as we're standing there, I realized I looked at her. She was twenty three years old at the time, and I knew she was suffering. You know, we you know, and I looked at her. She was wearing, she was wearing jean pants, covered by a flowing skirt. Which was, which was sending me a message. The message was that, Dad, I want to really respect you. And I don't want to do anything to hurt you. But really, I want to wear pants, right? So I thought to myself, eventually, look, this girl wants to wear pants. Let her wear pants. Well, why am I standing in her way? She wants to, express, especially since she has, you know, let's call it body image issues and, you know, body dysmorphia and anorexia and so on. Let her dress and feel as comfortable as she can in her own body. I discussed with my wife, and I discussed it with a couple of the other Haverim and my brother who's a Rav, my brother-in-law's a very wise man and everyone was on the same page, of course. In the interim, before I could tell her what, what you know, to do this, she had a first suicide attempt and she found herself uh, in uh, Cornell in Westchester. And after a few days, um, when things were settling down and she was medically stabilized, 
I came over to her and I said, you remember Yechever that night when we were outside, you know, we were East Village and you were dressed that way. I think you'd look great in pants. I think you should change your wardrobe when we get home. I think you should, your mommy should go out to the store and buy a whole new wardrobe. And she said to me, really? Are you, are you serious? I said, yeah, I'm serious. And you could see the, like the load, one of the loads. I mean, she had many loads, right? One of those kind of be lifted from her shoulder. And kachava, that's exactly what happened. You know, after she was released from hospital, she went, I can send you pictures. She went, uh, in fact, one of those videos, you know, you can see it. But she, she went and bought a beautiful wardrobe. And she looked great. And I'm, I'm proud of that moment only because I knew that in this very, very uh, small way, I was able to contribute um, to her, her happiness. Um, so I think it was a good move, and I think other parents should recognize. Let's not submit, let's not sweat the small stuff. You know, there are, there are bigger, there are bigger problems. Let's not sweat the small stuff. And I'm guilty of this myself. When I was look, looking for a um, eating disorder clinic, um, someone someone told me about a clinic that uh, is fully kosher, and I was speaking to my friend uh, uh, Benny Zippel in, in Utah, who's a, who's a chef in Utah. About the after, he was a tzaddik. Yeah, yeah, we went to shiver together, Morris. Now I didn't know that. And he said to me, "I've remembered." I said, he said, Mota. he said to me, Avrami, what are you doing? Just find the best place for her and don't worry about whether they keep kosher or not. And he was like, so right. And that's, that was my, my, my mahalach after that. So <coughs> the message he's is, you know, a, I think, he's a smart man and you listened. I listened, exactly. I did listen. And he actually, when, he, when she was there, he connected with her because she was there during Tishrei. He, he, uh, he brought the Avraminim over and I sent her a shofar. She had a brother shofar, which I have a recording of. So uh, and he was very good. He was very good to have a lot of gratitude to him for that. You know, what, when you when you read the Rambam's writing, Ramb Rambam Maimonides writing about depression. Um, have you ever seen? He, he, there was a period in his life where he struggled with with depression, and you know, he just we, the term described as marash chayra. You know, that's the it became like sort of a Yiddish one of these melancholy, right? Melancholy, yeah, but it's like a mishmash of Yiddish and Aramaic and Hebrew that we use the term Marashchayda. Uh, Shachar is, is dark, black. black, and and means the world looks black. And and he describes it like as a heavy load. I mean, it's 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 incredible to think that a person like the Rambam, you know, struggled himself with with. Uh, with with the with the depression or Mar or as he calls it there, um, it's really remarkable. I think it's something that that the public just doesn't understand, myself included. You know uh, uh, how it comes, where it comes. You know what's the best thing. I, I, let me ask you. Let me ask you a practical question. Having walked on this very painful path, what would you suggest? What would your daughter have want? What did your daughter gain the most from in terms of interaction? If I'm, if I'm, you know, if I was a peer of your daughter's, and I heard that she was struggling with depression, or somebody my age comes out publicly and says I'm struggling with depression, what's the what's the right thing to say? I know there's no right thing, but what is the what what would you recommend as best practices for good, decent people in the public who just want to do the right thing? They, they, they use this word validation. That's the most important thing. You know, people are depressed for a whole host of re different reasons. So you can't say there's one reason for everybody, but they all want to be recognized. You know, I'm hurting. I recognize you're hurting. I'm sorry. Is there anything I can do for you? How can I make can, this easy? Can you explain what the validation means? What, what do you, what you mean? What did you mean exactly? In, in the world of them, in, in street talk, what did you, what, what did you mean man to man? What is it? What do you mean by validation? In a world I, where, and I'm, I was guilty of this myself, you know, many people accuse me of being the perfect father, I was not. So I'm guilty of this myself. Um, validation means that in a world where um, mental health is uh, kind of second tier, sometimes people who are suffering from mental health, and quite obviously so, are told, oh, you'll get over it. Oh, you'll be fine in the morning. You know, go to sleep, have a rest, go for a walk, you know, as opposed to, uh, being apathetic and, and showing love and care and saying, you know, I, I know that you're suffering. I know that you're hurting. I'm here with, for you. If there's anything that you need, you let me know. Or can I do this for you? I can see that you're struggling with this particular task. Would it be easier for you 
to, for example, we might, when, when my daughter was applying to grad school, now she was applying to a PhD program, little things were difficult for her to do in the application. Like there were five tasks, recommendation letter, whatever it is. She was, for some reason, it was a block for her. She couldn't do it. So you have it, let's get, let's sit down, make a list. There are five items. Okay, let's chuck of this item, let's chuck of that item. And it kind of, you know, and without having to say, you know, you are, you are ill and you are intelligent and you should be doing this yourself. You know, happy to be so, but rather, let, let's just slowly, we get through, we'll, we'll get through this. You have two months to the deadline for, uh, for, your, for, your, for your grad school application. You know, just, just being there, you know, just being understanding and being, uh, being a listener. And, um, and, you know, the best therapists, I think, are, 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 are good listeners. And the best therapists are also those that ask good questions. You know, somebody, just to, for the public, for everybody who's watching, you know, to, to th this talk of empathetic listening, it's, you know, it sounds like if you're not familiar with the expressions of, and, and, and all of this, it sounds like, like just stuff that therapists say to each other, you know, and people nod their heads. I was, Avrami, I had a really fascinating experience uh, years ago. I, we did a, t I arranged for a talk on, on child abuse. And one of the agencies that was participating backed out at the last minute. And I was very upset. And I, I called, I called the, the clinical director and I, I said, come on, you know, I was really excited. I mean, people were really excited to, to I'm excited and looking forward to it. And, and she said, um, that must have been so frustrating, Rabbi Horowitz. She was doing empathetic listening on me. And she said that this must be so frustrating, Rabbi Horowitz. I, I was ready to tear, you know, I was, I was a lot younger then. And I was like, I was steaming. She says, it must be so frustrating to, to, to you. Yeah, I said, of course it's frustrating. She says, I know. And, and she did it like four or five times. And I remember like it was yesterday. I remember saying to myself, Yankee, she's empathetic listening. <laughs> And I said, could you stop that empathetic listening? She right. said, and she said, it must be so frustrating when I do that. <laughs> <laughs> Something else is frustrating. And I felt the anger just dissipating. It, it was right. fascinating. And like, you know, to be a recipient of it and for a minor thing, of course, but I, I just want to really convey to the public the stuff works that, and, and you don't, I would add one thing to Avram's very wise words is that a very brilliant therapist told this to me years ago that when people come and talk to you, uh, whether it's adolescents or parents, um, sometimes they're looking for guidance, but a lot of times they're looking for validation. They don't expect you to solve their problems, but they just, they just want you to- they Want to be noticed. They want to be noticed. They want to listen. They want to be able to talk to you and see that, that they can come and talk to you about some struggles they're having with, with their children or kids themselves. Um, you know, I, I see this most, whatever, I, I see this a lot, that, that the, the empathetic listening is so important. I'm sorry, Ram, please. I don't, I don't remember what I was... Um, you were talking about, but that I asked you... Oh, you'd asked me what the... What, people, yeah. what so, people I mean, could do. I know now my work today, when I say my work, I mean, I don't make any money from it because it's just a passion of mine for some, in some strange way, which I don't really understand. Um, a lot of people who are suffering reach out to me. I don't understand. I'm not a professional. I'm not a rabbi. And I, I've, I've made peace with the fact that they just seem to view me as someone that uh, will understand them where unfortunately much of the world does not, including their own parents and own siblings. And uh, most of the time, I don't have solutions, except, you know, making referrals and so on. Most times I don't have solutions, but it's just the, it's the art of just having a conversation and being able to listen. At first I would just be like, do this and do that. You know, you know, but now it's just like, I'm just listening, you know, I'll, 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 we'll talk, you know, talk to me about your day and then how do you feel now, you know? You should Rav Shimon Schwab says, Rav Shimon Schwab, I, I, was I good to hear it. I, I had the big schos, the merit of teaching a few of his grandchildren. So that one of the bar mitzvahs he spoke, and he said this word, it's in his, his book, is safe from Ayin Beis Sheva. But so he said that the first time the Torah uses the word friend, the first time the Torah uses the word friend is by the story of Yehuda and Tamar. And it says that he gave 
the objects that he in, in the hands biyad re'ehu adulami in the hands of his friend this person who was not from Yaakov's family and Ashwab says that a friend is someone you can tell anything to and um, it was I'm sorry yeah I'm I'm nodding my head because I I mean how do you become a friend in literally 40 seconds I mean sometimes that's what it calls. is but the and, and people intuitively feel this people intuitively feel it <coughs> yeah you know they they intuitively feel you know look when we spoke for those who just joined um I didn't even know uh Rabbi Avram I never we never communicated at all to, 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 until yesterday by the way he didn't reach out for himself of course the, in this, this so searing week uh of of his daughter's yard site he was calling to find out if he could help someone who had reached out to him for help that's what a kind of person he is and we just bonded immediately it's like we've known each other all our lives we we were finishing each other's sentences last night um and and look i i i you don't know why when i was younger i was much smarter i was able to figure everything out now uh so i think what you're doing is a tremendous public service that that people that you're relatable and people can talk to you and they, and and I see I saw last night why people you know when you spoke you spoke to me told me people are are reaching out to you and you were a little bewildered and overwhelmed by the number of people that were coming um I I thought to myself <laughs> no brainer you know you 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 perfect you you I'm not cast got with tying this to the tragedy but I'm saying being here where you are I I I think I really think that you're you're helping people more than you even know. Well, yeah, I look at it as a thank you for those kind words. I look at it as a multi-year project. And the more people I talk to, the more lessons I learn. And uh although, you know, like like you said, we met yesterday. I know that you do a lot of work in in parenting. I think you have parenting workshops as far as yeah. as far as I know. And the reason I bring that up is because the bottom line is that the you know there's there's often the discussion there's often the the question the debate do we have more incidents of mental health challenges today than we did had 20 years ago or was it said 20 years ago we swept it under the rug i can tell you that from st- statistically let's talk about suicide the suicide rate today amongst young women is much higher than it was um um 18 you know 12 years ago 14 years ago so i don't actually understand what's happening I don't understand why there's such a high incidence of of mental health challenges. Um a young lady that I was talking with I was you know not telling her was talking to about social media so she was arguing with me and talking to me about the difference between correlation and causation. So there's there's social media and there's connections there's a there's a book called Lost Connections by Owen Harry where he talks about the importance of making those connections with with other human beings as opposed to being you know glued to your to your media and so on. So I don't know what the answer is but what all, all I can tell you is that we talk a lot about uh mental health awareness and stigma and so on I think we've talked about mental health awareness and stigma enough I mean to say is that we can talk about it some more and it's important to be aware and to recognize those that suffer but I think it's time to start you know at the very beginning and try to figure out and it may take you a long time and start to figure out um what have what have we done to create this environment where so many people are suffering and what can we do better from the very beginning as a as a as a husband and a wife with our children and then having children early childhood education i have a brother in australia michael gorari who's is a, a rav there who talks about this a lot uh the role of the parent the role of the parents um how to discipline the child and so on um he talks a lot about the the concept of chesed and gvura that on the one hand there's not just you know we think about it as kindness and and what's converse you know harshness or something but rather it's there's olam khasdi bana that the world is based on on kindness but there is accountability you know you can be you can be loving but you can be firm it's it's not a it's not a everything anything goes kind of generation it shouldn't be and it is unfortunately um i do think that social media and by extension um 
any kind of electronic uh, usage plays a big role. I don't think it's the only reason. I don't know what the, perhaps I'll, I'll talk. I mean, I can just off the bat, I can talk about uh, academic, um, academic um, competition, too much learning. Let the kids go play in the street, you know, too much yeshiva. Why, why keep learning Gemara all day? And someone mentioned the other night that people used to learn Gemara at 12, now they're learning at 11, now they're learning at 10. Now each year old's learning Gemara. Why? I mean, you know, go, you know, go play soccer, go play football, go play basketball. I mean, I come from South Africa, soccer, right? So, so those who don't know, I keep on saying that we finish each other's sentences. I wrote about 10 articles about this okay. over the past 20 years, that, that we should be starting Gemara later and learning less and... and you know, and you know, there was what's the rush, whatever. What's that? People forget the reason why kids go to school, I believe. People think that they go to school to get educated with knowledge. I don't think that's the reason. As Yidden, I think the reason that kids go to school, remember, it's our, it's our responsibility as parents to, not the not the, right? So the reason that the kids go to school, the goal should be that kids should emerge with a love for a joyful Yiddishkeit. That's it. And yes, building blocks of learning, which they can do their entire life. But some will learn, some will achieve, and some won't. Doesn't mean they're doesn't mean that they're lesser. It does and not mean that they're it does not mean that they're lesser. What happens is though that the children in in when when the children are are in school, that's really the only path to success is to be a good student. And then when they get later in life then they're able to do other things where they where they where they can succeed and c contribute to the community um, in so many different ways. So we need to redefine success. What success is exactly. And I, I I always used to tell my my students. Um, I volunteered to take when I was eighth grade ready to teach the students who had not yet been successful in learning. Um, my, I, I volunteered for the eighth grade to take the the, the they, they were tracked then so. I took the, most of the years they were tracked. I took the, the weaker students or the kids who were at least weaker at the time. And I used to always tell them life is longer than school. Life is longer than school. That's brilliant. I love that. What? I love that. That's great. You know, and, and you know, you talked about validation. Everybody out there, parents, grandparents, community members, anyone who cares, um, you know, you say, you try to be kind to kids, you try to give them good messages, and at the time, you, you don't see any impact. My Rebbe Rav Pamzatzal used to say, he used to say that uh, Chazal, our, our sages compare uh, educators to stars, the stars in the heaven, not, <laughs> not stars in Hollywood, you know, that the, they compare them to stars. So Rebbe gave such a brilliant interpretation. He said um, that the stars, the light, that they produce. You go out and see a beautiful uh, star out there twinkling now. So it's four light years away. That means that light was produced in 2017 and it took four years to get here. So Rebbe can said- I, Can I interrupt you for one second? Please, please, go ahead. Because there's a comment here that I want to just talk about. Someone wrote, extracurricular activities are so crucially important, especially for children that don't excel scholastically. The mistake in this comment there is that it's not extracurricular, it's intracurricular curricular. It should be part of the curriculum, right. not something extra. Like, okay, we're gonna learn and we're gonna do something extra apart from learning. It should be part of the learning discipline. So I think the word extracurricular is a misnomer. In that case, go ahead. No, so, so, so Dr. by the way, parenthetically, Dr. Norman Blumenthal. Um, well, I've spoken with He, I'm sorry? I've spoken with him, he, he helped yeah. us. Yeah, oh yeah, he's, he's, he does a lot of bereavement work. So he, so he, once, said, he once told me that he was, uh, he was um, laying out an educational plan for parents whose kids wasn't making it in school. And then he said, and I understand that he likes to play the guitar, so please get him guitar lessons. So the parents said, you just gave me a $20,000 bill between tutors and, and extra, you know, now it's 22000 So he said, you're spending $20,000 every single thing that he's not good in. Why don't you spend $2,000 on something that, he said that he's good in? That's exactly right. So, so Rebbe Rav Tanzatal, he said that you, that as educators, it, it, you know, you spoke about uh, um, the importance of, of children feeling a love for learning um, uh, rather than, you didn't say that, but rather than, you know, covering ground, um, 
So Rebbe said that, that the messages that we give to children, the, these, the values that we try to teach them and, and the messages we give them, it doesn't, you know, they don't, you don't, you very often, or most of the times, you don't see the impact right away. So Rebbe said it's like a star. You don't be frustrated if you don't see immediate improvement. The words are, are settling there someplace. It takes four light years to get, they'll take 15 light years to get to them. You know, and these kind words that you tell the kids, uh, especially when they're struggling, especially someone who's dealing with depression or anything like that. Um, you know, even if you don't get that instant reaction, that, 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 that's, you know, that's, that's the best thing you can do. Um, I, I, I watched the video, part, part of the video you sent me about the Chesed project that they, that they did. In the kindness, kindness project. The Kindness project in, in, in honor of your daughter. Can you share with us a little bit about that? I found it very inspiring. Uh, sure. So it, it started um, very shortly after Yechavit passed away. I posted something online um, where someone by the name of Eli Nash uh, reacted to and made contact with me and he said, Avremi, let's turn this into something positive because I was kind of leading to a negative slant. Right. And it was his idea, and he put a sponsorship and a partner of his behind something called the Kindness Project, where we started in Crown Heights. And the idea is that- It started, it started in Crown Heights? Okay. Yeah, was, right. The one we just completed was just for Crown Heights schools. We, mm -hmm. we hope to expand it, and there are other communities that have expressed interest. But the point is that uh, oftentimes teachers go unrecognized for, they, well, they'll always be recognized for, you know, producing academically superior students. But will they be recognized for being kind to students? And we want to recognize, we wanted to recognize those teachers. So we, yeah. so we, we're asking students, past or present, you know, nominate a teacher who was kind to you and write what, you know, send it in. What was, what, what the kindness was. What the kindness was and you tell us your story. And, uh, for, and there were six awards. There was a, a, a male teacher, a female teacher, each got $15,000. Then there was a, a, a childhood friend, male and female, and a classmate, male and female. And in, in total, it was about over $40,000 in, in awards. More important than the money was the buzz that it created in Crown Heights, especially, and within, within, you know, throughout the Chabad community, about this discussion of kindness. Oh, I was kind to this person, I was kind to that person. The, the importance of, t of teachers being kind to one another. Um, and all the stories that came came. And the reason that it was so connected to Yechever because Yechever himself was a very, very, very kind person. You're not going to find one person that will tell you that she was unkind. I'll tell you a beautiful story that someone told us. We, we met by Shiva. Um, and she came over to Shiva. She was 20. She's a 20-year-old girl, essentially. This is a young lady. And she told us when she was four years old, she was in the same school as, as Yechever. And... Uh, and um, age difference of about four or five years. So if everyone was you know, older than her, and at that age, it's, uh, you know, it's quite significant. And it makes a, big, it makes a bigger difference. Than it makes a bigger difference, that's right. And what happened was that she, this, this young lady came from a home that's, that didn't drink any soda because it was a very health conscious home. So this four-year-old kid sees a friend who had a Sprite. So she stole the Sprite. What happened? The teacher caught her. It's a four-year-old kid, I just want to remind you. The teacher quarter yeah. berated her in front of the entire class and kicked her out of the classroom. And now she finds herself, you know, outside on, on the floor, bawling her eyes out. Down the hallway, who comes by? Yecheva Gorari, who was about nine at the time, and sits with her and comforts her. Wow. wow. And uh, she, told us about, she told us this by Shiva. And uh, there, there's this tens and tens and tens of these stories that came out and she's told us, that's what I remember about Yechevet. You know, do I remember that she was this ama amazing, you know, valedictorian in high school and, you know, summa cum laude and she graduated Macaulay with a 4.0 GPA and got accepted, you know, the PhD uh, program with a scholarship. None of that. At, at Ivy League school, not, no, she was a kind person. So there's been a lot of, Baruch Hashem, a lot of awareness made about the importance of kindness um, over and above all. <laughs> Really, an extraordinary story. That at that age, to have sensitivity. Who does that, right? I wouldn't. 
I did. Uh, the, kid, the, kid, the kid's crying. I'll walk on. So in my in my speech last week, I don't know if you saw the video. I saw parts of it. Yeah. Well, the beginning the beginning part was that uh, when the Rebbe became Rebbe. Yes, I, I heard that. I, heard. I mean, this is a beautiful, it's most beautiful I'll, thing. It's the most say, tell everybody, please. It's the most beautiful thing. And his first mimer, Basil Lagani, he gave in Yutzva Tavshin Yud Aleph, nineteen fifty one. It was basically a clar clarion call. It was a call to the Chassidim to, you know, what their mission in life is going to be. And he, he made the following point that whatever the Abishta asks us to do, the Abishta does himself. Like we say, um, you know, if Abishta if asks us to put on film, the Abishta Kaviyachal puts on film himself. So the Rebbe was saying this to tell us, I'm asking you to do this, kach v'kach. And just so you understand, whatever Rabbeim, he was a seventh generation, Kol Shvi and Chaviv, whatever Rabbeim, are asking the chassidim to do, they, are, they themselves are doing. And then he started enumer enumerating and listing a bunch of examples. And you could have think, oh, you could, could think that the example would be about uh, Shemir Shabbos and the Hidurim Pesach and the, you know, how long it sits or so, I don't know. But instead he listed an example, an example of, uh, of kindness of each of the rabbin, starting from the Alter Rebbe all the way to the Fidik Rebbe. Each of the, Chabad, each of the seven Chabad Rebbe. Seven Chabad Rebbe, exactly. Which uh, kind of, to me, that's like the foundational mission of uh, that everything should be based upon. Everything else, there, you know, everything follows from that. Um, now, the Rebbe, since he was telling the story, I get a little controversial. Is that okay? Go for it. Yeah. So because yeah, the Rebbe yeah. was telling, was saying the mimer, he didn't, he didn't mention, he did not mention a story about himself. So there's actually a story that happened with the Rebbe that I mentioned in that speech. But the story that I, that I initially had prepared was a different story completely, which is a fascinating story. That there were two, there were two Talmudim of Lubavitch, uh, going back to the times of Friedrich Rebbe before 1951. Friedrich Rebbe was the Rebbe. Uh, Rayas. Yiddish means previous. Previous, of, previous, of, yeah. Yiddish. So that was the sixth Rebbe in the chain, Rebbe Nachman Mendel. The... Right. Previous Lubavitch Rebbe was the seventh. That's what uh, Rebbe Remy was talking about before. Go, please. I'm sorry. So uh, there were two Talmudim who went through kind of, you know, through the channels of Lubavitch. Those two Talmudim were Rabbi Shlomo Kalbach and Rabbi Zalman Shechter. I don't know if you know. There was, these were from the first two that were sent out to the colleges and spread Yiddish guide and so on. Mm -hmm. They both went their own way and kind of left Lubavitch I don't say they, they rejected Lubavitch, but they kind of went their own way, did their own thing. And Zalman Shechter, there's actually a YouTube video, you can see this. And he tells the following story, that he, that after having been away from Chabad for about 40 years, everybody used to get, give out dolls on a Sunday morning. He decided for whatever reason, I actually found out later that, I think Rabbi Simon Jacobson told me that he, Simon had told him to come, whatever the case is, uh, he came by the Rebbe for dollars on a Sunday morning. And he thought to himself, the Rebbe's going to be so upset with me. The Rebbe's going to like reject me because I did all this, you know, which is not in keeping with Chabad tradition and so on. And as I came past the Rebbe, Zalman says, um, um, the Rebbe said to me, the Bizdach HaKoyen, you're a Koyen. Zalman Shech says, yes. No, it's about the Yontif. It was before Rosh Hashanah, Hamich and Zinin, have me in mind. The Rebbe was telling Zalman Shech that he's wow. a Koyen. And... Uh, when he benches them, then he, when he and have me in mind by breakfast coin him. Can you imagine? And then he said he, he was expressing his own feelings and he's saying, I felt like I'd I had to fly the coop at a certain time in my life and then I was accepted back. And this is, you know, who who would do that? Yeah. You know? And if I, if it was me, I'd say, You low life, how <laughs> dare you come in front of me like this and after all the pain that sorry you've caught you've caused me. And uh, that's what the Rebbe was 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 famous for and famed for. And uh, I just wish everyone, myself included, could emulate that. Yes. Live by that example. Um, I know you've been, you've been, <clears throat> just, you know, uh, Ram is not, wanted this morning, so he was, wasn't sure if he'd be able to make it because he wasn't feeling 100%. So I, I'm going to keep to the time limit that I said. I said, fine, you can go as long as you want. Okay. Um, you mentioned about the people who are reaching out to you for help. Um, 
how are you dealing with all of it and, and what should a person do if they, if they are looking for help? How are you managing? How am I managing personally? No, I'm saying no, no. I'm saying are, are you able to help people who are reaching out to you? In, in, in so what is my help? What is my function? Like, I, I'm constantly asking myself and getting more clarity. Like, what can I do? And the first thing I say to everybody, why are you calling me? Call a therapist. Are you suicidal? Go to hospital. You know, are you depressed? Do you have a psychiatrist? Are you taking your medication? Why are you talking to me? Because, because the, my answer is, you know, having experienced uh, in different ways that sometimes um, having the, the, getting sort of the green light um, and, and suggesting that that's the right thing to do, which by the way, I say all the time also, um, it's important. It's very important for them to hear to hear that. Some, sometimes, sometimes pe the, the people who don't need the nudge in that in that direction are there already. They're at the therapists already, and they're at the the, the, the ward in the hospital. You know, the, for people who are who are struggling with with, with emotional wellness. Um, so the ones who are coming need a little bit of a nudge. That's what. That's a, that's how I see it. The people who are, who first of all the people the people who know people who are able to access um, the health. I think it's also about connection. Just you know, just connection. Right, I'm saying it. There are a few young ladies that um, you know who I who I correspond with live in different cities that are just, just so lonely and suffering on their own, and they their their neighbors and friends don't even know what they're going through. Right, and they can confide in me. And, uh, and I often have to get um, counsel, now they meaning advice, what to say and what not to say. Because sometimes we're dealing with very, um, you know, severe stories. And I don't want to do, do or say the wrong thing. Yeah. So I'll try to be responsible about it. Rabbi Avram, thank you so very much on behalf of everyone who's on, um, and whoever's going to listen to the videos and uh, watch, watch the videos. Um, I thank you. I, I, I cannot begin to imagine um, what this is like for you. I, I just cannot begin to imagine. Um, and to have the ability to part that part of you and help people is, is just a remarkable, remarkable um, thing to do. I see where you have it got it from. I'm doing my best. She was better than me. That, that's all you could. All you could do is your best. All you could do is your best. Try my best. That's all. Hashem should should comfort you as only he can in your family. Thank you very much. And I you that. have these beautiful memories of of your chavit. For those, I'm going to post up for. I'm going to post up a few links. Um, one of them was the speech that that Avram just gave that he referenced, and and the two Instagram posts. Um, Riachevit posted singing with her father, and it was just something special. I want to tell you, I, I told you, I told you, I told, uh, I told the Rav Ram right away when I saw that thing. I said, I fell in love with you. I said, this is it, this is it. And and I I, I told you that I I think she put that was her message to you. Thanks, Dad. Thanks for always being. No, I think it was because I think she like I told you earlier. I think she knew what she was going to do. Yeah, she, she put that, that on social media as a as as a present to me. I think that was my that was my reaction. That yeah. she she said that Dad, thanks for always being there. You know, so Hashem should comfort you. I have some final thoughts that I'd like to share um, after Rabbi Avram goes. So if you're interested in staying on, please do. Um, Rabbi Avram, be, be well. Hashem should Thank comfort you. you and feel. I look forward to growing our friendship. Thank you very much. I'm sorry in all your work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank be you. well. That gives it. Bye bye. Thank you. Wow. 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 Um, it's not often that I'm at a loss for words. Um, I just, I need to process all of that. Um, I, I think, I think our takeaway for all of us from, um, from, of Remy's words, um, 
I think the, the, the top takeaways that I take away, I want to listen to it again and take some notes and, and think about what he said. But I think he was mostly telling us about the importance of validation, that, that when people are, are suffering, especially depression, you know, if somebody breaks, if somebody breaks their leg, um, that's something we can relate to. So we see somebody, we're, we're empathetic. You know, if someone if someone is suffering, God forbid, from a cancer or any other illness, that we understand. The chol and nefesh, the 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 mental, um, the mental wellness component, many of us thankfully don't understand. And you know, to to stay away from, to try to stay away from those trite statements that well-meaning people say but are hurtful to the people are suffering from the mental wellness uh, issues. Um, like, you know, I oh, just get over it. Uh, you know, tomorrow's another day. Everything's going to be fine. Just be optimistic. You know, that really doesn't, doesn't do it. And what they really want to hear is their empathy. And, and I, I also think, you know, for kids who are struggling, you just came across in everything he said, um, and everything he said, came across his unconditional love for, for Yocheved. And, and when you, if you see that, that looking at each other while he's playing the music there, you just see it all. Um, and, and that's just to try to, to try to, <clears throat> to try to f somehow find the strength to, to accept our children no matter what's going on. And, and, he had the story with the pants that, that you know, that she, she was wearing a skirt on top of pants and he told her, why don't you just, if that's who you are, just wear pants. I mean, it, it, there are just so many, so many nuggets and parts of this. And, and so I just want to, want to close by, by encouraging maybe in your heaven's memory, um, to, to, to try to validate, to be empathetic, to try, we can't understand, we can't really understand, but, it's it's very important that we that we that we empathize even if we can't solve what what people are dealing with you know a number of years ago um i was about three and a half four years ago i was at i was at a um a panel discussion in a jewish heritage center ran uh, run i don't know if they still do it they had a New Year's Eve, they had uh, um, like a, a fundraiser and the attraction, so to speak, you know, the, what they had a few of us on a panel answering questions from the public. It was Moshe Spain, who was the president of the OU, Eitan Kobri, who was a writer in Mishpacha, and myself. And one of the questions that came up was, um, without compromising on halacha, on Jewish law, what should we do with the growing number of LGBTQ um, you know, teens and adults in our community. And, you know, I responded like, like I always, you know, I'm, I, I try to think of myself as, a, as an honest straight shooter. So I said that, you know, that I'll post that video also, the link to that, to that um, in the comments here. So I, I said, look, I haven't figured it all out theologically. You know, I have not figured this out. I still, I'm still, a, you know, Torah observant, but that doesn't mean you have, to, you have to be able to figure everything out. But I do know that there are children and that we have to be empathetic and we have to listen to them and treat them with cover, with respect, and, and as they're trying to figure it out. I'm sorry about this long-winded story, but this is really the crux of it. So I posted up that video on my social media. It got uh, 10,000, about 10,000 views overnight. And I was contacted probably by north of 100 LGBTQ young men and women and their parents, separately and some together. Um, and, you know, it was a little bit overwhelming. And I tried to get back to, to do what I could to, to communicate. Um, but my wife and I invited 10 of the young men and women who had reached out. We invited them to our home for lunch. So we invited these 10 LGBTQ uh, uh, kids, kids, young men and women. They were probably in age from, you know, 18 to, to 30. And we went, there are, 
there are two things that I want to share with you because you don't see that side of the curtain often. Many of you don't see this. And I think it's important that if you can't see it, to try to understand it or see it through my eyes. Um, so we went around the table. I said, you know, you want to introduce yourself. You want to say your name, that's fine. If you don't want to, that's also fine. Um, you know, we're here. We're here at home. I just want to talk to you and I want to learn a little bit more about your world and let me know what I can do to help. So one of the... So one of the young men who was there, when we went around the table introducing ourselves, one of them said to me, he said, I just want you to know, Rabbi Horowitz, when I sat down in the chair here, I, I made a shechiyano. The shechiyano was a blessing that we make um, when we reach milestones. You know, chag, uh, yom tov, and we do other things. So he said, in other words, he, he reached a milestone in his life. So I, I, you know, he, so he said, I never dreamed, he said, growing up gay, he, he said he knew from very young, uh, or very early in his life that, that he was gay. And he said, I never dreamed in my life, that in my lifetime, someone like you would invite me to your home. I can't believe, I, I never imagined that someone like you, a rabbi, would invite me to your home. And my heart broke into a hundred little pieces that people in our community, I know it's a complicated issue. I'm not, I'm not even going there. I'm not even discussing the bigger issues and, and you know, there are very important issues, public policy issues. I'm not even going there. I'm just talking about an individual feeling that he's not worthy of, of being welcomed by someone with a rabbi before his name. Think about that. Um, it was just so heartbreaking. It was so heartbreaking. And the second part, the second story was that towards the end, and I, I'm sorry, let me interrupt myself for a second. The reason I'm saying this, it does not have anything to do with directly with what Reverend Ram was talking about. Um, but it's an overall, it, it's, it's someone carrying a burden um, that's misunderstood. And it's when someone carrying a burden um, that can't tell anyone about it. And it's, it just compounds things so much. It compounds things so much needlessly. The first part that they have to struggle with, that's difficult. That's, that is, that's what it is. Um, but the fact that they feel someone with mental wellness issues, someone who's suffering from depression, might not feel comfortable enough talking to the beards and the suits, you know, people in the community, the, the grown-ups. Um, and the fact that a kid would think that I wouldn't welcome him in my home because, because he's gay, what a burden that is. Then, towards the end, we, we just communicated, we, we spent about two hours together. And towards the end, I asked, I asked the young men and women, I said, tell me, what message would you like me to convey to the public? That was my question. I said, look, maybe I could be your voice in some way. What would you like the public to know? Um, and I went around the table. Almost all of them said similar things. It, it's so painful for me to say. It's so hurtful that this is what they wanted. So they said, the, the message was, please tell people not to say hurtful things to us. We're trying to figure it out ourselves. Please tell people not to say hurtful things. 
we have to do a better job, folks. We just have to um, search our souls and realize that they're our children. Um, they're children of your friends that might not be comfortable enough telling you. And I wish that you'd think about making them comfortable and giving people the space, trying to exude that, me that, that message that, that you're approachable and people can talk to you about anything. Um, but that, that they, we shouldn't say hurtful things to them. That's, you know, we're losing so many of our beautiful children. Yocheved wasn't the teen at risk. She didn't have this whole LGBT issue. She got LGBT issue. She just suffered from depression. Everyone is different, but everything is, you know, in, in some ways, in some ways, the loneliness of being, of having these burdens causes children to, to, to harm themselves. And, you know, I spoke to one of the leading gedolim, one of the sages of our generation years ago about this, uh, LGBTQ issue, and I'm picking that as an example. I'm not saying it's only this. It's these types of things that people are carrying around the stone in their heart and would love nothing more than to just have an ear where they could talk to them. But, but the, the kids told me then, when we went around the table, they said, look, Rebbe, we don't expect anybody to figure it out for us. We haven't figured it out. We're trying to work through it. But we have to, we must, must, uh, be able to to be empathetic, and that 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 children shouldn't feel stigmatized with, with mental illness. They shouldn't feel stigmatized with with other types of issues that they're grappling with. Now, again, the issues are large, and I'm not going into them. But just as far as the people are concerned, to, I think one of the messages I would love for us to walk away from listening to Avrami is that we um, we should try to realize that people who we don't know are suffering are suffering and that we possibly could do something to help them. <sighs> Have a good night, everyone. I'm go like I said in the comments here, I'm going to post some links. Um, please avail yourselves of them. And if you have any, I left my email address. I'll put it in the comments also. Um, I'll be glad to do a follow-up, maybe with a therapist, or maybe if anybody has specific questions, please feel free to post them in the comments here. Or if you don't want your name on it, you can email them. It will be treated as confidential to ryh at thebrightbeginnings.com. I'm going to sit down now and post a few links to this talk um, and, and just encourage you all to, to reach out if you have any questions. And like I said, I'll try to bring some experts in who I, I really do not understand this mental wellness issue um, as well as I should or as well. I'm, look, I'm not a professional. I, I'm not a therapist. I would like to bring on some people who could help. Okay, so good night, everyone. Um, thank you for listening. Yochevet, um, Neshama, should have Nalia. And may Hashem comfort her family. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.